Klal Yisrael approaches the 13th Siyam of Daf Yemi, all of us are so excited because people, tens of thousands of people, are going to get together not only in MetLife Stadium in New Jersey, but all over the world there will be Siyumim to celebrate the learning, the consistency of learning Torah every single day and finishing Masechtas, finishing Mishnayis, and most of all, finishing Shas. Every night we say the words, Ki heim chayenu yameinu. Our Torah is our lifeline. From the moment that Moshe Rabbeinu brought down the Luchais at Har Sinai, until this very day, we celebrate every day with learning Torah. And that's the one word that we can use when we think about anyone who makes us see him. The word is consistency. As you will hear from the five stories that I am about to tell you, you will see great people, simple people, old people, young people, everyone in their own way in different parts of the world involved with Limud HaTayra. Let's listen closely. Let's be inspired by all the great people that we are going to hear about. And let's see if we can make Siyumim as well on all parts of the Torah, whether it's Chumash, Mishnayis, Masechtas, anything that will show Hashem that more than anything else, we love His Torah and we look to learn it every single day. I like to call this story for the love of Torah. A number of years ago, I had the great honor to spend Shabbos morning with one of the great people of our generation, Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel. Rav Nassim Tzvi Nebuch passed away in 2011, but it was under his guidance that the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim became one of the biggest yeshivas in the world, with thousands and thousands of Talmidim located throughout Yerushalayim. That Shabbos morning, Rav Nassim Tzvi told me a most remarkable story. You see, when he was growing up, he was like any young American boy. He lived in Chicago, where his parents owned a catering business. He loved playing basketball, and he was tall and good-looking. No one would ever have guessed that he would one day become a pillar of Torah for Klal Yisrael. One summer, Rav Nassim Tzvi's father said to him, You know, I'd like to go visit my father's brother in Eretz Yisrael, and I want to take you with me. Rav Nassim Tzvi was so excited, and he looked forward to seeing his great uncle. That was his grandfather's brother, because he was none other than Rav Leza Yudel Finkel, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. Well, when they finally arrived, Rav Leza Yudel was incredibly impressed with this young boy, Nassim Tzvi. He noticed how refined he was, how ehrlich he was, and he was so enamored by the way the boy wanted to learn, and they learned together throughout Nassim Tzvi's stay with his parents in Eretz Yisrael. When it was time for Rav Nassim Tzvi and his parents to leave, Rav Leza Yudel didn't want his great nephew Nassim Tzvi to go. He asked him to stay in Yerushalayim and continue to learn. Of course, Nassim Tzvi's parents were not thrilled at the idea of their young son staying in Eretz Yisrael while they went back to America. And suddenly, Mrs. Finkel told me it hit her. It was an opportunity for her to make a sacrifice as well. Just like Avram Avinu was willing to sacrifice his son for Hashem, so too she could sacrifice, in a sense, her son for the sake of Torah. And she did. She allowed her son Nussan Tzvi to stay in Eretz Yisrael with her husband's uncle. Of course, Rabbi Lezi Yudl, and that was his first step on the path to becoming a tremendous Talmud Chacham. Now, although Rav Nassim Tzvi was lucky enough to get deeply involved in Torah learning at the Mir, things were not easy for him at first. He told me that at that time he was behind all the other boys his age, and he had to work very hard to catch up. After all, at that time the level of Torah learning in Chicago was certainly not what it was in Yerushalayim. But all of this struggle was worth it, for the wonderful opportunity Rav Nassim Tzvi had to spend with his great uncle, Rav Lezi Yudl. They would learn together regularly, and Rav Nassim Tzvi absorbed every drop of Torah that he could. Every day, Rav Lezi Yudl would get up two or three o'clock in the morning and learn for hours before Shachris. 
One night, the young boy heard noises in the middle of the night, and he woke up. He crept out of bed, and he peeked through the slit of the open door, and he looked into the dining room, and he was astonished by what he saw. In the dining room was his beloved great-uncle, Rablazi Yudel, standing in front of the swarm shells with his arms wrapped around the shas that were on the shelf. Unaware that anyone was watching, Rablazi Yudel bent down and kissed some of the Gemaras. It was as if as he was saying good morning to them. As he stood watching the scene, the young Nussan Tzvi was struck by the genuine love that his great uncle had for Torah and learning. It made an indelible impression on me, he told me. And you know, after I returned to America and I finished high school, I knew in my heart that I would return to Eretz Yisrael. I could not stay away from a place where there was such a great love of Torah. Today, anyone who knew Rav Nassim Tzvi can tell you that there was nothing greater to him than learning Torah and finishing Masechtas. He once gave a magnificent speech, and those lucky enough to hear him remember him saying that the sweetest words that a person can say are the words that we all say when we finish a Masechta. Hadron Aloch, I will return to you. Masai Mashas, say. Hadron Alecha, Talmud Bafli. Whoever heard such beautiful words, such sweet words, Hadron Alecha, Talmud Bafli. When two people who love each other are about to be separated, they promise that they will return to each other no matter what. So too, someone who loves Torah with all his heart will never stay separated from it even once he finishes a particular Masechta. These words were made into a beautiful song, and that's what I would like you all to listen to and remember of Nassim Tzvi's passion and yearning for Taira. As we approach the Sea Mashas, we too have the opportunity to embrace Taira and grow in it. May we be Zaycha to take the inspiration from this Sea Mashas and use it to make our own Siyumim and to increase our love of Torah and truly follow in the path of Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel, Zeicha Tzadik Lavrok. I like to call this story a dream come true. As we approach the upcoming Siyam Ashas, there is one person who is in the forefront of our minds, and that is Rav Meir Shapiro. After all, it was his idea that people should start learning Daf Yemi in the first place. But how did that start? I remember having a wonderful discussion with Rabbi Avram Osban Shlita, the Rosh Yeshiva of the Tells Yeshiva in Riverdale, and he told me something fascinating. When Ramey Shapiro was a little boy, his mother hired a private tutor to learn with him every day. Rabmeya's mother was very, very proud of her son's learning, so much so that when he began to learn Gemara, she made a big suda for all the Rabbanim and Talmud Chachamim in the area. A few years later, the Shapiro family moved away from the place where Rav Meir had grown up. Although there were a lot of worries and concerns that come with moving your family far away, the top concern on his mother's mind was that little Meir's tutor should be waiting for him when he arrived so that they could learn together. As they settled into their new home, she kept checking the time and listening for a knock at the door. But that new tutor never came. As the night grew later, Rabbi Meir's mother realized that the tutor wouldn't be coming that day. And you know what she did? She sat down and she started to cry. Her little son saw her crying and he said to her, Mama, why are you crying? And she said something to him that he would never forget. A day of learning that is lost can never be made up. These words were heard by a little boy in a dark, quiet house, but they were words that would one day spark a movement that would have tremendous impact on all of Klai Yisrael. Many years later, in 1923, at the Knesset Gedola in Vienna, Rab Meir Shapiro stood up and proposed the idea of the Dafyemi for the very first time. The idea could have ended there, but a few months later on Rosh Hashanah in that year, the Gera Rebbe, the Imre Emes, announced that they were going to begin learning 
Masechta Brochus that very night. Thousands of Gera Hasidim took out their Gemaras and started to learn the exact same page of Beis Amid Aleph in the first Masechta, which was Brochus, just as Rav Meir had envisioned. But here's where the story becomes truly fascinating. Rav Pinchas Hirschsprung, a beloved Talmud of Rav Meir Shapiro, remembers that during the Aseris Yimei Tshuva, immediately following that Rosh Hashanah, Rav Meir Shapiro got a letter from his sister. In the letter, she told him that on that first night of Rosh Hashanah, she dreamt of their mother who had passed away years earlier. I've never dreamed about her before, she wrote her brother, but I dreamt she was walking in Gan Eden wearing a crown. When I discussed this unusual story with Avram Osband, he told me that he thinks the reason Rab Meir's sister had this dream goes all the way back to that life-changing sentence that was told to Rab Meir by his mother when he was a little boy, that a day of learning that is lost can never be made up. That sentence was the seed that blossomed into the idea of the Dafyemi and was put into action on that first night of Rosh Hashanah in the year 1923. On that night, thousands of Gera Hasidim who sat in that Beish Medrash opened up the first page of Masech Tabrachas and brought the crown of Torah back to its original source. They were Makayim that expression, Achzoras HaTorah LeYoshna. The return of the crown to its former standing. And so that night, Rabbi Meir's sister dreamt of her mother, who truly deserved to wear a crown in the schus of the spark she ignited that would lead her son to have so many thousands of people learn Torah and so that the Torah was once again crowned. When we learn Torah ourselves, we are in a sense wearing that crown of Torah on our heads as well. In these months leading to the Sea Mashas, let us try to be Messiah anything we can, whether it's a Harshan Chumash, whether it's the entire Chumash, whether it's a Seder of Mishnayis, or the Mishnayis of one Masechta, and of course, the Masechta itself. So we too can restore the crown of Torah and participate in a Siyam that would make Rav Meir Shapiro so proud. I call this story the Talmud and the Talmud. On August 1 in the year 2012, I had the great schus to be present at MetLife Stadium along with 95,000 other Jews to celebrate the incredible 12th Siyam Hashas. The Siyam was one in a long chain of Siyumim which take place every seven and a half years, dating back to 1923 when Rabbi Meir Shapiro came up with the groundbreaking idea of the Dafyemi system. Jews from all over the country and all over the world gathered at MetLife Stadium on that day, each with his own story to tell. From the Magid Shir from Toronto celebrating his second round of teaching the entire Daf Yemi cycle, to the man traveling from Virginia who had finished Shas for the very first time with Daf Yemi, and to the father from Mexico bringing his little boy to see the great gathering of Jews celebrating the sweetness of Torah. The thousands of Jews in the crowd were united by their excitement to celebrate the completion of the entire Shas. Although I must have met dozens of people that day, there was one man that stood out to me among all the others. As I was sitting in the stands with my family, a gentleman I had never met before came over to me. He introduced himself as Rabbi Akiva Serebrowski and he told me that he had a very special story to tell me that would explain not only his presence at the Siam, but also the presence of a very special young man that was standing beside him. This is his story. In the fall of 2001, Rabbi Serebrowski left the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim and started teaching in the Menorah Academy in Edmonton, Canada. He was teaching Chumash to the third and fourth graders, and that fall, he began teaching them Mishnayis. Now, to begin the new subject, he told the class that the Mishnah was the source for all the Gemaras that came afterwards. 
He explained that there are six orders or six Siddharam of Mishnayis, and there are many Gemaras that comprise the entire Shas. To finish off his explanation, he mentioned that there are indeed many people that know the entire Shas by heart. Great Torah scholars, Gedolim such as Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, and Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, and he promised to bring in pictures of these Gedolim the next day to show them to the class. Soon after he finished his talk with his boys, the bell rang for recess. The boys were indoors that day because it was very cold, and Rabbi Serebrowski remained in the classroom to supervise. As he sat at his desk, he overheard two boys talking. One boy, let's call him Simon, but the other boy, his name was actually Josh Siegel. And Simon said to Josh, Do you think that our Rebbe knows all of Shas? Now, at that time, Rabbi Serebrowski told me he definitely did not know all of Shas. He was a young man, a busy Rebbe, and he simply hadn't gotten there yet. But then he heard Josh Siegel say confidently, Of course he knows Shas. He's a Rebbe, isn't he? Listening to this conversation, Rabbi Serebrowski suddenly felt terrible. Listen to the boys, he thought. They believe so strongly that I, their beloved Rebbe, knows all of Shas. I can't let them down. Starting today, I will become a person who knows all of Shas. And at that very moment, sitting there in the classroom, Rabbi Akiva Serebrowski undertook to learn all of Shas. A few years later, Rabbi Serebrowski moved to Toronto. By then, he was learning Shas every morning. He learned the Dafyomi every day, working up sometimes very early and sometimes staying up very late to complete the daily Daf. And it wasn't always easy, but he always remembered those boys in the classroom and especially what Josh Siegel said, and that pushed him ahead no matter what. Now, as this 12th Siyam Shas was getting closer, he suddenly had a great idea. Why shouldn't he invite Josh Siegel, the very boy who had set him on the path to finishing Shas? He should invite him to come with him to the Siyam. Picked up the phone, and he called Josh's mother in Edmonton. And he found out that Josh was actually learning in a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. Well, after telling her the whole story, he said to her, I would love to buy a very special ticket for Josh to come with me to the Siyam Shas. When she heard that, she was so thrilled. She said she would fly him into America for that special occasion. And she was true to her word. Indeed, Josh flew into Newark Airport from Eretz Yisrael, and Rabbi Serebrowski met him there, and he drove him to the stadium, where he brought him over to me and told me the whole story. Later, Rabbi Serebrowski asked Josh if he remembered that conversation from long ago, but he didn't. He had only been a little boy at the time, but it was only because of the pedestal that Josh had put Rabbi Serebrowski on that he finally completed all of Shas. After the Siam, Rabbi Serebrowski drove with Josh to the base Medrash Gavaya and Lakewood, and there they spent the next two days learning the first two blot of Brochas together, which, as you know, is the first Masechta, beginning the cycle of Shas again. How beautiful this story is, and how powerful is the impact of a little boy that he had on his Rebbe. May we all be zeichet to impact people for the good in the way that Josh Siegel did, even though he really didn't even know it. And may we all be able to participate in the upcoming 13th Siam, each of us with our own incredible story to tell, and each of us with a Siam of some sort in our Holy Torah. In the end of the 1800s, there lived a tremendous Talmud Chacham named Rav Yaakov David Wolofsky, or as he was commonly called, the Ridvaz. He was a very prominent Rav in a city called Slutsk in Poland. He was there for many years, although he spent the last few years of his life living in Tzfas in Eretz Yisrael. He wrote a very famous parish, a commentary on Talmud Yerushalmi, and it's printed today in every copy of the Yerushalmi. This story took place in Tzfas, 
when the Ridvaz was already a much older man. One year, on his father's yard site, the men in his shul noticed something unusual. The Ridvaz, who had come to shul a little early, stood by his shtender with his head resting on his arms, and everyone could see that the Ridvaz was crying. The other men at the shul were very surprised, because even though a yurt site is actually a sad day, the Ritva's father had died almost 50 years earlier, and he had died at an old age. And so they couldn't help, but they asked him, why was he suddenly so affected by the yurt site this year? And he said, let me tell you why. And as all the men stood listening, the Ritva's began to tell an incredible story that they would never forget. And to tell you the truth, Rab Shalom Shradron, the Maggid of Yerushalayim, he eventually heard the story and he was the one who told it to me. The Ritva said, when I was a young boy, there was a Malamid in our town called Rab Chaim Sender. He was a private tutor and he charged one ruble a month to learn with me. My parents worked very, very hard in order to come up with that monthly ruble to pay that malama that was so special so that I could learn with him. My father made a living selling furnaces and ovens. But one winter, there was a shortage of lime and cement. Those were the materials that you needed to build a furnace or an oven. Business was very bad. And my father just couldn't sell furnaces. There was no lime to make them. And we were very poor. And although my parents tried to save every penny they could, they could not afford to pay the Malamed. Three months went by, and the Malamed continued to teach me, even though he was not being paid. But after the third month, he came to my parents and he said, I'm so sorry, but if you want me to continue teaching your son, I must be paid. I need to support my family. My parents were devastated. My learning meant more to them than anything else and they were willing to do anything to allow me to keep learning. But it seemed there was nothing they could do. They just had no money. That night, my father went to shul, feeling so dejected. But he happened to overhear a conversation between a very wealthy man in the community and his friend. The wealthy man was complaining that he was trying to build a house for his son and daughter-in-law, but he couldn't get a furnace anywhere because of the shortage. I need this furnace, the wealthy man said. I'll pay as much as six rubles for it. As my father listened to the conversation, he could not believe his luck. He rushed home and he said to my mother, I know exactly how we can pay the tutor. He told her about the wealthy man and the furnace. And my mother said, but how will you make a furnace? You don't have any cement or lime. I know, said my father, but if we take apart our furnace, we can use the parts to build a new one for the wealthy man. They agreed to do this, and the next day, they took apart their own furnace brick by brick so that they could get those six rubles to pay for my learning. In Russia, a furnace was a vital household item because it was used to cook food and keep warm in the bitter cold winters. But my parents didn't even think about the cold. They were so excited to sell the furnace that had been taken apart and give to the wealthy man, the new one, that they had built. And with that money, they would pay the tutor. The next day, I proudly brought the money to the tutor, enough to pay for the past three months, as well as for the upcoming three months. That winter was so cold and uncomfortable for our family, but my parents were happy, because they knew that I was learning Taira from the best Malamed in town. This morning, said the Ritvaz, as I was walking to shul, I felt how cold it was outside. And I wondered if I should start having a minion in my home so I don't have to walk in the cold. But then when I remembered how my parents suffered in the cold for me, I welcomed the cold. And I wanted to feel it, to really appreciate their great mysterious nefesh that they had for me. And that's why I was crying when I came to shul. The Ridvaz's parents sacrificed so that he could become a great Talmud Chacham. And we see that he did indeed become a great prominent Talmud Chacham, one who will be known until Mashiach. And it was all because of his father who felt that there was nothing more important than to see his son learning Torah.